Next, we have the most exciting part of the program. I think we really have the distinct honor to have one of the, the heroes of MedTech innovation um, here today. Um, I don't think there's, um, there, there's, it would be a stretch to say that in the audience, uh, Stan, there are many Stan Lapidus's who will be, who will be rising up and perhaps they'll look to today as the inspiration for when they really got started in this, in this career. But Stan is an electrical engineer and, uh, and he is, we, we listened to him talk about a lot of technical details last night and I realize he still knows what end of the soldering iron is hot, so he's not one of those engineers who's lost it. He really is still there. So it's, and he's a fantastic career as an inventor and an entrepreneur and a faculty and a teacher at MIT. So it's really a great um, honor to have him here. I must admit something, I, I had, I harbored a resentment towards Stan from my PhD days. So when I was at MD Anderson Cancer Center, I was developing a, uh, for my PhD, uh, an alternative to the pap smear, and it used a very expensive laser that cost about $100,000 and required three of us engineers to, to operate it properly. And in the corner of that lab was a little device called the thin prep device. And it, we poo-pooed it because it didn't have a laser in it. It was kind of low tech. And that was, you know, Stan's invention from SciTech Corporation, and it went on to be tremendously successful. And it was so successful, I think you said it was declared a monopoly at one point because it was used in every single pap smear just about there across this institution and others. So um, that was very successful. It was a lesson learned for me that just because we're engineers doesn't mean we have to go with the high-tech, really cool, slick technology. But I, I did harbor that resentment for a long time of how come that thing beat us to, to it. So with that, um, the rest of his bio is here in the booklet, and with that, I'll, I'll lead to Stan. Now, so please join me in welcoming Stan to the stage. And Stan has, has about 30 minutes of comments, and then he, he is welcoming um, questions from you all. So during his talk, you, can, you have time to prepare some intelligent questions for him. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is, I'm honored to be here. It's very exciting. I don't spend most of my days asking better questions. I spend most of my days, as most engineers do, working on answers and generally trying to move the ball ahead 2% of the time. But from time to time in my life, and I'm sure in yours, great benefit will result from a little bit of reflection and asking better questions. I've, I've, uh, I had a job a long time ago. I worked at Raytheon through the 1970s and uh, started a number of companies since. So I'm going to tell you three vignettes about Raytheon, about SciTech, and about exact sciences, and a little bit about the opportunity I had to ask better questions, and a little bit about the lessons that I learned. So Raytheon uh, then and now is a multi-billion dollar defense contractor. It's very admired for its work. It has loyal employees, and it had a microscopic uh, you know, 0 0.1 percent of its business was in, in medical devices. Uh, particularly making gamma cameras. It had very low market share, was looking to make its name, came up with a very large field gamma camera. This is before I arrived. Placed a major bet, and the bet wasn't working out. And the day I showed up was the day some senior execs were talking about shutting it down. So first, let me tell you a little bit about nuclear medicine for those who are not familiar with it. This is a technology that emerged in the wake of World War II. Um, the idea is to inject an isotope into the body. The isotope concentrates in places of elevated metabolism. And if one can image this disintegration of individual gamma rays, one can map basically the metabolism of a body. The technology then was used primarily for uh, soft tumors and soft tissue and for primary tumors and soft tissue and for metastases detection. This is the Raytheon gamma camera, uh, 91 photomultiplier tubes. It weighed, oh, uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds because of all the lead shielding, and works like this. All gamma cameras uh, then and now work the same way. There's a, um, a patient who is irradiated, has, that is, has ingested an isotope, and the isotope has distributed itself in the body. Gamma rays that emerge from the body straight up are collimated, so they impinge on this big salt crystal, it's about this big, um, at the point in which the gamma ray hits a uh, salt atom, an NAI, a sodium iodide molecule, it disintegrates and emits about 1,000 photons. 1,000 photons each cause 
light in the photomultiplier tubes, and this array of photomultiplier tubes is an analog computer that localizes the point of emission. The initial gamma cameras were used for imaging thyroids. They contained seven photomultiplier tubes. The next generation uh, contained 19 photomultiplier tubes, the next generation 37, and the fields of view started to get larger and the resolution greater. So Raytheon's innovation at the time I joined was uh, a 20-inch field of view, basically could image the torso in one pass, but it had 91 photomultiplier tubes. And the problem is, is that keeping all 91 in tune was very difficult. Uh, you'd get dark spots, you'd get light spots on the final image, an image that would correspond to a flood field of, of radiation. So after a week or two, you would get flood fields. This thing should be perfectly uniform, and it would look, this field would look like this. Physicians couldn't interpret it. It was a service call. The equipment collectively developed a reputation for being unstable, across all manufacturers and from Raytheon, it was a matter of life and death. So before me, and uh, in many ways including me, uh, physicists and engineers had worked on developing better photomultiplier tubes, coming up with better ways to reliably couple, optically couple the tube to the salt crystal, to increase coupling pressure, and to do more stable circuitry. And simply none of this worked at the level of 91 photomultiplier tubes. It was quite poignant. I had just moved to Boston that day and, and learned that a meeting was taking place about shutting down the business. I was 28 years old, and I barged in and said, I have an idea. It's really just, it was um, a prepared mind on the one hand, because I had learned a great deal about the traditional approaches and also understood that I would not be able to contribute to it. But I was a new employee. I couldn't crack the physics. But I had this idea of maybe we could measure the non-uniformities regularly, say once a day, and calibrate them out. So if we had a cold spot, we could make the pulse width larger that illuminated that area of the, of the flood field. And um, modulating the dot intensity in inverse proportion to the local density. So not everyone was a believer. The fellow, Raytheon, as I mentioned, was a successful defense contractor, and literally the fellow who invented radar was in the room. This was a meeting of senior technical and business executives that I barged into, and he said, I don't believe it'll work, and he gave his reasons why, but I did get 90 days and $25,000 to build a prototype. I wound up getting my first patent. It did work, and Harold Hart was the guy's name, came by some months later to shake my hand and to congratulate me, so I thought he was 10 feet tall. And just a moment about Harold Hart. So there's every opportunity for an old curmudgeon, now a guy like me, to say, that's not going to work. And it takes a special guy to say, well, it did work. I need to uh, let him know uh, that, that it did. It's, it was a good thing that he did. And that kind of stuff has a ripple effect in organizations. So it worked. This is what the best tuned flood field that we could do without the uniformity correction device. It was about 20% across, and within a matter of hours or days, it would drift out to the kind of images I showed you. This is after correction. The only non-uniformities here are due to the uh, poor quality of the, the projection. It was dead flat across. So what happened was good. Uh, a new standard of practice was created. To this day, all gamma cameras use either this approach or approaches that derive from this approach. Uh, sales doubled for Raytheon, so this was a good commercial success. I got $100 for the patent. It was good. Now, by statute, you're, you, a dollar is what you need to be paid, but I got 100 So I thought if I could do this once a month, that could supplement my income in a meaningful way. My wife thought I was crazy. Um, I also got a promise of being a VP in 20 years. Now, this would have made me at Raytheon an under 50-year-old VP, which was almost unheard of. So uh, that was, that was the, what happened. So I quit. So that was um, very clear to me. Raytheon is a good company at which to work. And you, don't, you get paid whether you invent stuff or not. The people were kind, were smart. And uh, it was a good work environment. But it wasn't the work environment for me. So at the time I quit, my wife was pregnant with our first son. Uh, we, this was our net worth, and this was our mortgage. So we were not rolling in dough, to say the least, but I did quit. I started an engineering consulting business. That turned into an industrial machine vision company, and uh, we wound up doing machine vision systems for car companies. Um, uh, 
me tell you first what I learned about my Raytheon experience is you can compete with the smart guys. This was my first aha moment that there was more to uh, professional life than drawing schematics and reducing the number of chips and increasing the speed, the resolution. That, that really, one with an engineering background can compete with the very smart physicists that were in the, in the field. And it was not because I worked on doing a better job at the physics, but on restating the problem and simply asking, how do I assure that the field is of uniform, we assure uniform density? So it, didn't, it wasn't a physics fix at all. And then my interests were not aligned and I set out on my own. Um, the Industrial Machine Vision Company turned out okay. Everybody made money. At the end, I had $200,000 of walking around money. And at the end, what that is, is two of my investors approached me and said, uh, we like what you did here. The company ultimately was bought by, by Siemens some years later. Uh, but we like what you did. So here's 200K of seed money. See if you come up with any interesting ideas. If you do, maybe we'll invest some more. The first period of time uh, with that in the bank, I spent thinking about what, what should the characteristics of a company that will be more successful than ITRAN have? And I thought, well, big markets, a clear value proposition, and in medicine, Value propositions are easy to articulate. They are, we save lives, we reduce morbidity, or we reduce costs, ideally all three, but at least one. And that for all the hard work that goes into developing a market and articulating a value proposition, one needs to have ultimately a strongly protectable position. We think primarily of patents, but it could be licenses, it could be FDA approvals, it could be dominant sales forces, but something that once you've got something important allows you to keep and to continue to benefit from it. I added two initial constraints that were really me specific. One was I actually like being in life science. I much preferred it to being in, than to being in the car industry. And, and I thought of myself as an imaging guy. This is what I knew. And so the questions I asked myself were, given those first three points, what are interesting imaging problems in life sciences? And within about three months, I landed on uh, the, the problem of the pap smear and started a company called Cytic. I renamed our little $200,000 uh, startup in, into Cytic. So the background is this, that from the beginning of time till the mid 20th century, cervical cancer was the number one cancer killer in women. Uh, wide use of the pap smear from the 1960s on led to a substantial decline in mortality, but there were plenty of problems of false positives, false negatives, smears that needed to be redone. The human costs of the pap smear program were great in terms of anxiety due to false positives of, of miscarriages and of uh, uh, women who could no longer conceive because of overtreatment. And the error rate, the error rate was high and the economic cost was very high. It was a multi-billion dollar program in the US to do pap smears and to do the follow-up. This is the um, female reproductive tract, the cervix, the cervix means neck, so the neck to the uh, uterus is, is this area here. And for reasons that weren't clear at the time, the cervix was the focus of pre-malignant and then malignant wart-like lesions. The cervix is accessible with a short uh, a spatula or broom or brush. Cells can be scraped. Cells that exfoliate can be scraped, smeared on a slide, and examined one by one microscopically. It's not an automated test. It's not like a blood test. It's not like an immunoassay. What one is looking for are, across the spectrum going from left to right here, are cells that look de-differentiated, that look less mature, that have smaller cytoplasmic areas and larger nucleus to cytoplasmic ratios. So this is very easy on an illustration like this, but is very hard on a pap smear slide because of blood and mucus that overlies the, um, overlies everything actually. Um, cervical cancer was the first cancer to be understood as a cancer that in fact progresses very slowly, that it takes many years to go from the first identifiable changes until full-blown and, and, and poorly treatable cancer. I think since then, uh, Many cancers are now viewed this way, but at the time, cervical cancer was viewed uniquely as a slowly progressing cancer. So the idea is, if you can detect precancerous changes in cells prior to the development of full-blown cancer, a very simple excision procedure would be curative. 
and mortality would plummet. This is what a tray of traditional pap smears looks like. There's 20 slides to a tray. Each a typical, a patient typically gets two. Um, and the microscopic examination proceeds across what is essentially 100,000 fields of view per slide, looking for nuclei that are big and dark um, against a background of blood and mucus and, and cells layered on top of each other. It turns out to be quite tough, no matter how attentive one is. And even the smallest lapse of attention can have tragic consequences for a patient. So the view in the 1980s about etiology was not informed by what has now become our modern understanding of cancer. It was all epidemiological. And these views, this, this background, simply wasn't helpful in, in achieving better cancer control. Uh, at Johns Hopkins, at MIT, and, and a handful of other institutions, the modern view emerged, most notably here in the laboratory of Bert Vogelstein and Ken Kinsler, that cancer results from the accumulation of mutations. But pap smears aren't about looking for mutations. They're about changes in morphology, changes in the shape of cells and their nuclei. Uh, well, let me talk a little about George Papanikolaou, after whom the pap smear is named. He was an immigrant from Greece. He studied uh, the estrus cycle the, the, of guinea pigs, then the estrus cycle of his wife. And the idea of his research was to find the, a biological measure of the optimum time for a woman to get pregnant when her um, odds are the best. And his, his work was presented at something called, a, a, an important part of his work was presented in 1928 at a eugenics conference sponsored by the Kellogg brothers of serial fame, quite the racist guys. And their goal was to have white women reproduce at a rapid, more rapid, Northern European Protestant white women reproduce at a more rapid rate of, be more fertile than others, thereby achieving their racial goal. And Papa Nicolaou's work was on use, developing these delicately colored dyes, finding the optimum time um, to see if there's an assay for the right time for a woman to, to get pregnant. Well, what he found was uh, that women who had pre-malignant and malignant lesions had transformed cells that he could visualize. This was a byproduct of his research, and this became the focus of the rest of his life. He published from 1928 throughout the 1940s with, all, with very little recognition. He did get published, but very little recognition. You could get a pap smear in New York at his clinic, but that's the only place you could get a pap smear. But in 1954, he published the Atlas of Exfoliative Cytology. And this was a beautifully illustrated book with these creamy pages. Uh, illustrating all, of, all the abnormalities one might find in, in, in the cervix. And this really kicked off the era of the modern pap smear. By the 1980s, there were 50 million smears done in the US a year at an average price of $12. And, 50, $12. and so $600 million market every year. There were pap mills which did patently low quality work for prices as little as $1.75. There was a shortage of technologists to read the slides. And new federal legislation put caps on the number of slides and put up in place quality programs, all of which put even more pressure on high quality, um, low cost pap smears with a pap smear industry that couldn't accommodate the, the demand. As we said before, high false negatives, high false positives, 10% of all slides needed to be redone because they were unsatisfactory or less than optimal at a time when patients expected perfection. And at the time I was getting involved, the Wall Street Journal ran an article on bad pap smear laboratories. And, and this re really resonated with federal, uh, uh, with, with Congress and the initiative to drive improvements in pap smear quality occurred. Uh, and, and the medical malpractice bar found through this article a new bonanza. So now it put a lot of quality pressure on physicians who were doing pap smears, but at the same time there was pricing pressure on them. So the idea that I had with my $200,000 in the bank was maybe com computers, I'm an imaging guy, maybe computers could read pap smears better. And it wasn't an idea that, that was original with me. There were no commercial products. But the, if, if Pap published his 
book in 1954. By 1955, there was a company, another defense contractor, called Airborne Instruments Laboratory, which had begun to experiment with automated pap smear readers using something called flying spot scanners, a very uh, early imaging technology. The last sentence here is remarkable, but Airborne Instruments engineers hoped to start producing them, these instruments, commercially by 1957. Well, it took another 50 years for that, that to happen but not another 50 years for the field to make progress. A number of academic investigators, far more than I've listed here, but, but, but I think in my view these were the important ones, did work on imaging, did work on sample preparation, did work on quantitative staining, all the elements that would be needed to uh, automate pap smears. I, I particularly was impressed with the work of two young guys, David Zonheiser and Peter Oud, and I hooked up with them. Uh, David was an MIT guy who did his PhD in the Netherlands and developed a, it's called a flying spot scanner, another flying spot scanner for the imaging of pap smears, and in very controlled slides was able to find abnormal cells. So a lot of progress was made by a guy working by himself. Uh, Peter had worked on stains that were quantitative, and he had worked on cyto pre cytological preparation methods. Uh, Peter's idea was to deposit cells on a filter to, uh, with a vacuum, suck them onto the filter surface, transfer, uh, moving to the next station here, um, transferring cells to a glass slide with pressure from a sponge. Um, so, so David and Peter had made important contributions to the field of automation. We had built uh, a prototype based on, on, on their particularly on David's insights of image analysis. We worked with the conventional pap smear because that's what the market told us uh, was needed. You can't change the pap smear. You have to read conventional pap smears. And, the, and this was from an early display. We would find cells with big dark nuclei and present them to the cytotechnologist so he or she would not need to examine every microscope field. The problem is, that overlapping normal cells looked like cancer cells. And if there were cancer cells present, they were usually, they weren't on the list at all or they were so far down that they were skipped. So uh, I'd have to say it failed. We came up with a new way, really out of, born out of that failure. And that failure wasn't a moment. It wasn't like we had a clinical trial that failed. Every day we would actually do a little better, but it was also clear that we were simply not getting close to doing as well as humans. And, and here the, the management dilemma was, okay, do we continue or do we stop? We all are programmed to work harder, more focus, more drive, egg the team on, do late nights, and sometimes that's the wrong answer. And making that call is really hard and flies in the face of everybody's uh, desire to keep doing more. But we came up with a new way of making pap smears, and this is a comparison of what, what got to be called the thin prep pap smear versus the conventional slide. And I think the cellular features here, this is from the same patient, the cellular features that are difficult to see here are very easy to see here. It's not the same pap smear. It required retraining. A tray of pap smear slides with a thin prep looks like this. They're uniform, they're the same size, around 50,000 cells each. There's no mucus. Blood, red blood cells are gone. It's actually much easier to examine, and the preps are more representative of the cervix from which the cells were taken. So to make a better pap smear, you have to collect and stabilize the sample. This is work that uh, Peter and David partially did, as well as others. You have to disaggregate cells, but not too much, because the clustering of cells is itself a clue. Turns out you have to estimate the cell density. You really want to get, if your target's to get 50,000 cells, uh, if you have 500,000, it's too many, you won't be able to see through them, and if you have, say, 10,000, you don't have enough to satisfy statistical requirements. Uh, you have to transfer the cells, and Peter worked this out. Staining Peter worked out, and interpretation is what our clinical cl clinic clinicians did all along. So estimating cell, de cell density, was an entirely unsolved problem, and this was my small contribution to the effort. Um, the thin prep principle, the way we make thin preps, is based on the French press coffee pot, and the idea is that we use this at home, and one day I had overfilled it, pressed very, very hard to get the plunger down, it exploded, I was cleaning up the, ca the counter, I was thinking about the physics of this, and it's pretty simple. The delta P is proportional to the percentage coverage of the filter until the filter is occluded, and then you break the, you break the glass. 
Um, so if you suck cells up onto the filter slowly, as the filter gets covered, the sucking taking place from the inside here, as the filter gets covered, the delta P increases, or if you withdraw a fixed amount of air with a small sip, the time for the filter to equilibrate gets longer. So a 20% increase in equilibration time is 20% coverage. And that's when you stop and you've got exactly, not exactly, but very close to 50,000 cells, because all epithelial cells are the same size. Um, so this got, we got the first of many patents on this invention. It turned out to have broad claims for measuring particles, but was not the only way to estimate density. But over time, I guess it's been shown it was the, the best way, at least to date. The instrument the company built looked like this. It's a, it was a $30,000 instrument at the time. The disposables were um, $10 disposables of a, a cylinder, a filter, and, and a proprietary suspension uh, fluid. Uh, the benefits were the thin prep sample was more representative, it was easier to read, finds more cancers, resolves early changes, so-called ASCUS, uh, atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, resolves them better, less subject to artifacts like air drying, can be read faster. So a lot of benefits. Uh, this was the first paper published in 94 that didn't have a cytic author on it. There were quite a number of papers until that point with cytic authors describing the technology, and this was a multi-site study. The, the results were a series of patents that collectively were pretty strong, reduction in screening errors. Uh, FDA finally, after a very arduous process, approved the thin prep as the first improvement in pap smears in 50 years. Now, once you have a label as better than, clinicians who don't use your device uh, will lose malpractice suits if they're sued for medical errors. So this was very, very important to the company. There have been over 800 publications on thin preps over the years. In 2002, as Yusuf mentioned, uh, Cytic was looking to acquire a company called Digene, which made a test for HPV, and the Federal Trade Commission said, you're a monopoly, you can't do this. So Cytic got declared a monopoly because it was doing so well six years after FDA approval. It was acquired for $6 billion in 2007, and at which point it remains part of Hologic, which is an integrated women's uh, uh, healthcare company. For me, the high point was in 2012 when my colleague a former colleague, Dan Lapin, delivered prototype number one to the Smithsonian, and um, so he, he sent this photo along. I was quite, quite moved, I have to say. Uh, the better question here, as it turned out, was not how to optimize image analysis of the pap smear, that's what I set out to do, um, but how to make a better pap smear. And that had great business benefits, great public health benefits. Um, uh, it was a great ride. I ran the company for seven years, from 87 to 94, and uh, hired a guy named Pat Sullivan, a wonderful guy who did a great job as my successor. He ran it until uh, uh, he sold the company to Hologic. I started to think about, in the context of lessons learned, what to do next, and ask myself what other cancers are epidemiologically important for which early detection might improve outcomes, and uh, therefore there'd be a large market, uh, there'd be a clear value proposition, maybe some inventions, and we'd use the methods of cytology, of examination of cells on a slide. So in 92, three, there was a publication in the New England Journal reporting on, I think it was a 13-year study, of detecting colorectal cancer um, from smears from a stool sample, looking for trace elements of blood. The test itself isn't very sensitive, but by doing this repeatedly, annually, for this slowly developing cancer, uh, there was a 20 to 30 percent reduction in mortality. So, a, you know, you could say 70 to 80 percent of people derive no benefit, but 20 to 30 percent reduction in mortality turns out to be a big deal. Here's the problem. The colon is a big organ. It's got a very rapidly multiplying epithelium, and every cell division is an opportunity for a mismitosis to take place, a mis cell division to take place, and for malignancy, malignant changes to, to, to develop. It's a big organ. Unlike the cervix, you can't get to it easily. You can put a colonoscope in it, but it distends the organ. It's painful to do. You have to clean out the bowel. And so 
colonoscopic screening is possible, but it's expensive. Patients need to be sedated. The bowel prep is frightening and painful. And uh, compliance isn't, wasn't great then, and it's not good now, even though rigorous application of colonoscopy on all age-eligible individuals could eradicate the disorder. So we came up with an idea for another approach. It was this idea. We thought rather than bring the scope to the colon, let's take the use, let's use stool as a vehicle for sampling the colon and collect cells that are shed because the colon is the most rapidly dividing epithelium in the body, recover cells and examine them microscopically. Compared to the work we did with thin prep, it'd be a little more complicated because with thin prep we worked with blood and mucus. Here we'd work with blood, mucus, fibrous matter, and bacteria. Um, so it's an engineering problem, how to handle the specimen. We thought we could deal with that. And therefore, cytotechnologists would have a whole new area of examining uh, stool uh, cytology slides. It didn't work. simply didn't work. There were no cells in stool. But before giving up, I spent a little bit of time thinking about maybe there are other approaches and thought that we might be able to look for mutated DNA in stool. Cells are very fragile. DNA is very robust. Pretty much ionizing radiation and DNAs, enzymes called DNAs, which are not abundant in the colon, are the only things that kill DNA. But cells themselves are very, very fragile. So I thought this was an original idea. I was very pleased uh, with myself. And turned out it wasn't an original idea that, that, that David Sidransky here at Hopkins published in 1992. He was a, a fellow, I think, at the lab of, of Bert Vogelstein and Ken Kinsler, and showed that um, uh, one mutation associated with colorectal cancer can be identified in a fraction of patients who, who, who had contemporaneous tumors. The great work here was, in fact, work that, that, that Bert had pioneered going back to the 1980s, showing that Cancers develop when mutations accumulate in a single cell in that cell's progeny over the course of years. And that for colorectal cancer, one only needed to look at a fairly small number of genes. One didn't need to look at 20,000 genes, but we, I think our initial panel, contained three genes and just some hot spots on those genes. So it was a tractable problem. Um, we thought it was important not to do this in blood, but to do this in stool because for early lesions where the greatest payoff is in value proposition, catching a cancer early or catching a premalignant lesion early, you'd have to look in the fecal stream before there's a connection between the stool and the blood supply. So we focused on stool. We worked with Bert. Uh, we brought in some technology. The, the, Exact Sciences team and Bert and his team brought in great scientific chops. We worked with the Mayo Clinic as well as our clinical partner. And after a number of iterations, in 2014, uh, the team published a paper in the New England Journal with 92% sensitivity. It's astonishing compared to colonoscopy. And perhaps even more astonishing was a 70% sensitivity for high-grade adenomas. And since patients would be tested periodically, the hope is that the vast majority of adenomas will be caught non-invasively without colonoscopy. Well, we don't know that yet, how, how things will unfold, but we did get a visible flagship publication, strong FDA approval in 2014, a very strong label, 100,000 tests performed in 2014, which was the first full year of testing, 2015, and just this, to this morning, the company announced 40,000 tests in the first quarter. This is putting Exact on track to being the most rapidly growing company in the history of diagnostics. Nothing less than that. Uh, Medicare pays, United Healthcare pays, uh, a number of blues pay. The company's great uh, challenges that lie ahead right now aren't scientific. They have to do with reimbursement. The market cap, it's a public company, though I, I took it public. The market cap varies between $700 million and $3 billion. Uh, and, and my own optimism is high based on the rapid rate of growth of tests, the rapid rate of acceptance in the market. So the better questions here were not how to do cytology in stool, which is where I started, but simply think broadly how to non-invasively detect any neoplasia. And though I didn't talk about it here, uh, to detect very small amounts of mutated DNA against a lot of normal DNA in a sea of bacterial DNA required new assay methods. Uh, Tony Schuber and I developed new methods 
to quantitate, not to quantitate small differences, but to enumerate, to literally count alleles. And that technology is the basis of much of the diagnostic work that's done with next generation sequencing. So those patents wound up with, with LabCorp some years later. So these days, I'm working on uh, trying to develop a blood test for autism. Autism today is described by its syndrome, by the constellation of symptoms in children and, and, and adults who have it, impaired social interaction, impaired communication, and repetitive behavior. At that nexus, you have autism. It's important to detect it early because about 20% of kids who are detected early and get intensive behavioral therapy respond so well that the label is removed, the label of autism is removed. Very strong economic value proposition and very strong human value proposition. A complicating factor is nobody knows what causes autism. There's no Bert Vogelstein, Ken Kinsler yet of, of autism. Surely five to 20% of cases have a genetic component. We don't know what the causes are of the remainder. Nevertheless, we, we met some scientists at Children's Hospital in Boston, people with whom we had known from, from other work we had done. They had had some early success with, with RNA. So we, we put in quite an effort and conducted a large clinical trial on hundreds of children around the country, and we didn't have a good result. So RNA didn't work, and we're in the midst of pivoting now. So um, whatever the answer is, it isn't about RNA, and there may be no answer, but we're, we're in the midst of that pivot now. So I'm going to wrap up and talk a little bit about lessons that I learned. Um, so really, most of the time, I don't ask better questions. Most of the time, as I mentioned, I'm working on just answering the question posed last year, two years ago, three years ago. But a good time to ask better questions is when progress stumbles. Is it because sometimes there are always setbacks, or is it because fundamentally uh, what one's efforts are directed to will not result in something that's better. It's especially important in the early days when it's relatively easy to change direction and uh, one should consider changing direction. And the way to do this is to restate the problem. And, and in gamma cameras, it wasn't about the physics, it was about compensation, computerized compensation. With SciTIC, it wasn't about image processing, it was about prep, and so on. And the lesson that I learned uh, is, is don't define your business horizon, the things you can do around your current skill set. Get new skill sets. We learn throughout our lives, and, and we should not be afraid to learn new things. The hardest part of all of this pivoting stuff is getting others to agree with you that the time has come for a pivot. Our species does not like this kind of change. We're working hard. We're working 18 hours a day. We're getting better, but we're not getting good enough. Uh, in, in a company setting, you inevitably have to lay people off, and that's hard. They're people that have become your friends. Uh, boards of directors are suspicious of CEOs who change directions. Uh, there are many stakeholders, academic stakeholders, and managing a pivot is, is actually quite hard. You have to do this without running out of money, without engendering hostility, and without losing the confidence of people who've made a bet on you. So it's about effective communication. This isn't to talk about communication, but it's at the heart of, of making a pivot, having decided yourself that it's time to do so. The problem at hand changes. Surrounding yourself with the best people for that problem is really important. But it's also important to make changes as the needs change. Scientific advisors leave Employees leave when, when pivots occur. It's important to do these things gracefully and to do them honorably. People need to understand why their scientific advisor agreements aren't being renewed. And employees who, whom you, if you need to lay them off uh, or you need to let individuals go, need to understand why. Uh, given that all of you have, uh, by your, simply by your presence here, have an academic connection, I think one great thing to do in terms of keeping yourself surrounded with the best people is keep your JHU connections alive after you're gone. It will pay itself back many ways. If you have the opportunity to teach, to lecture, take those opportunities. It'll reward you. You'll be rewarded many, many fold. So this is, um, I think it's obvious, but I'll say it. Read everything and be unrelenting. Before meeting Bert the first time, I read every paper that he wrote. There were over 200 at the time. 
Uh, I didn't, I won't say that I read every one in depth, but I read every one, and I read a handful in depth. And if there are too many papers to read, go find another field. There are too many smart people working on this problem. And uh, you might be the smartest person in the room, but I never am, and so uh, that's a good sign to move on and look at another, another problem worth solving. You don't have to solve the most difficult problems in medicine. You should work on solving the problems you can. Uh, on the business side, just a few thoughts. Um, this is really the, the lesson of many years that focusing on problems that are clinically important and scientifically overlooked is a good predictor of success. The scientifically overlooked part means you have a manageable competitive environment as opposed to competing with a thousand of the best people in the world. And clinically important, I think, is obvious on the face of it. Value propositions should be easy to articulate to your parents, to, to lay people, to your friends who are not scientists or clinicians or engineers. And as you think about what to work on, think about your ability to create meaningful patents. After all, the bicycle market in the world is huge, but overall, it's not a very profitable business because there's no, no real IP. There are some niches in it, but mostly it's not. And it's all about cheap manufacturing and good marketing. That's not a business you want to be in. So last words before wrapping up, or this is my wrap up, is uh, I guess I'd exhort everyone here that you can learn anything. And I think, the, as I understand the curriculum here, this curriculum is particularly good at inculcating that. You, you, I think you learn that here, that you can learn anything, and therefore working on what's important is more likely to have impact than working on, on what you already know. So with that, uh, I'm done with my remarks and happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I, I would say that working at a large company after finishing a program here is a really good idea. Um, I, I hope that one doesn't interpret my remarks. I've lived my life in the entrepreneurial lane, but I really value the time I spent at Raytheon. And, uh, and I learned so much. I learned so much about good business practices, about best practices that after all was a well-run company. And companies like Medtronic and Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson are all great places to learn skills that you won't learn really in any other setting. As far as being an inventor goes, um, I wanted to be an inventor on my own account. I thought of myself as more inventive than my peers, rightly or wrongly, and, and thought that at $100 a patent, I'm not going to be ever able to pay for tuition for the kids, my growing family. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's, it's um, I think large, or large medium-sized medical device companies, and certainly companies the size of the companies I've, I've worked on, are all very receptive to inventions on the part of team members. It's, it, um, it's all kinds, whether it's bragging rights, whether it's the basis for a new business, whether it jacks up valuation. I, I think that companies generally are receptive to inventions that are aligned with the business of the company. And for an individual, it's great if you spend a few years at J&J, &J, say, and leave with a few patents on which you're the primary inventor or a co-inventor. That will help you launch whatever you do next. So one of the, the plain truths is uh, investing in medical devices and diagnostics goes in, in cycles. And now is not a great cycle for startup companies. Uh, you can make a lot of money. Investors can make a lot of money in diagnostics where I've been, but almost never make it quickly. And Exact Science has proven to be a very valuable company, but it took a long time with many uh, ups and downs along the way. As a private company, all our investors double their money every year from, in, from the time they invested till the IPO. It was a huge success. Uh, as a public company, it's had ups and downs. Right now, it's doing, doing pretty well. Um, other companies move more rapidly, but generally um, a decade from startup to liquidity is not un is common, I would say. Uh, it was nine years for Cytic from startup to IPO. It was six years or something for Exact from startup to IPO. These industries, these businesses are not quick. Uh, I'm sure the investment cycle will come around again. And uh, I've always been able to raise the money. I've not always raised it at the valuation I've wanted to, but I've always been able to raise the money, and you will too. 
I, I emphasize in my professional life and in, in the talks I do the idea of starting with a problem and then go figure out the right technical solution. Uh, I, I'm n probably not in the majority on that. Most, most inventors often in, invent, I should say, frequently invent in their space and they wind up being the guys who have inventions looking for a problem. Both methods work or both methods don't work. Um, when I started the cervical cancer search, I, I did have imaging technology in mind, and I thought of myself as a modestly accomplished imaging guy, not accomplished enough, as it turns out, to have automated the pap smear with imaging. But through the idea of, let me see if I can image pap smears, I learned about pap smears, and I learned that the real problem was PrEP. And so then we uh, weren't making progress with imaging, uh, we thought we could change the dialogue about what constitutes good cytology from a dialogue about automated imaging to improve PrEP. And similarly with each of the things I've worked on. So I did have a hypothesis. Um, I did have a modicum of expertise. By this time I started exact. I knew a lot about cytology and how to make samples. It turned out to be useless. But I got really intrigued with colorectal cancer, and I started to read the molecular biology literature and had no background in the field, but wound up with 20-something patents uh, and a, a growing portfolio of molecular biology patents. Um, by coming to it late, you know, as a middle-aged guy and uh, reading a lot and asking questions that only an outsider could ask. And that was, how do you detect really weak signals in a highly heterogeneous population? It wasn't a question that people were asking themselves then. But Tony and I did, and we came up with new ways to do that. You, you just Being an outsider is a good thing. Having some knowledge but not huge expertise is a good thing. Great. Before you go, thank you so much for that wonderful oh. interview. Oh. This is a small token of our appreciation for, it was designed and built in the design studio that Professor Tung mentioned. So uh, well, by thank one you of our much. students. So thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.